Hello, I'm Jerry Savoie, and I would like to welcome you to the uh, Oral History Project for the Grosses Point Village History Council. Uh, we will be speaking with Mr. Paul Bogan today, who will be telling us a bit about the history of Moore. Um, good morning, Mr. Bogan. I'm happy that you could come and be with us today. I'm very happy to be here, Ms. Lavoie. It's very kind of you to invite me to be here to tell a little about the history of Moores. Uh, I'm really substituting for Mrs. Lois Orr, who is our town historian, and she was unable to come, so I'm sort of pinch hitting, and we'll try to give you some of the history of Moores as it is written. Very good. Thank you Thank for you. coming. I would like to uh, first read a few paragraphs from the town history of Moores. The town history of Moores is located in the north central part of Clinton County in the middle of a tier of three towns that form a northern border of Clinton County. Moores is bordered on the north by Canada, on the west by Clinton and Ellenburg, by Altona on the south, and on the southeast corner by Chazy. It has an area of 83 square miles. The town was formed from the Canada and Nova Scotia refugee tract, which was land set apart and given in small parcels by the state government to refugees from Canada and Nova Scotia, who had taken part in the Revolutionary War on the side of the colonies. There are parts of bordering towns that are also made up of this tract. Not too many took advantage of this opportunity to settle in moors. The area was no doubt once occupied by Indians. The first white settler was Joshua Bosworth, who arrived in 1796 and built a log cabin on what is now known as the Brooks Flats. This borders Champlain Street on the east. He was later joined by his brother Ichabod, and by 1800, by 1800 there were several families living in the area around what is now Moore's village and north of the village. There were families by the name of Southwick, Fitch, Churchill, Perry, Knapp, Blackman, and Brooks. They were of French and English descent, and it came from Vermont and Massachusetts and Connecticut. The town of Moores was formed by state act from the town of Champlain on March the 20th, 1804, and the first town meeting was held in the home of John Shedden on August the 3rd, 1804. His home was located near the river, east of where the Methodist Church is located as of now. Until 1830, Moores included the area that is now Ellenburg. Moores was named in the honor of Major General Benjamin Moores, an early resident of Clinton County. He was the first sheriff of Clinton County and was elected four times to the State Assembly and once to the Senate. He was also, he also held the office of county treasurer for 42 years. At the time of the organization of the town, it included the following, the village of Moores, Moores Junction, Moores Forks, Woods Falls, Cannon's Corners, Blackman's Corners, Thorn's Corners, O'Brien's Corners, and Ellenburg. The village of Moores became incorporated in 1899, and at that time, Moores Junction became part of the village. The first meeting of the Board of Trustees was held at the office of A.J. Steinbarge on October the 18th, 1899. From 1900 to about 1925, the village of Moores was most thriving. The following businesses, many of which will be mentioned in more detail, later were located entirely within the village limits. An overall factory, grist mill, milk and cheese plants, three general stores, a variety store, a drug store, two millinery stores, dentist office, two doctors, two grain stores, a meat market, a shoe repair shop, coal and wood yard, two hotels, a restaurant, two barber shops, a hardware store, and a Ford dealership a shirt factory, a customs office, a telephone office, a post office, two blacksmith shops, four churches, a retail milk delivery, 
and an undertaking parlor. So you can see that Moore's at one time was quite a thriving community. Yeah, Thank you for listening to my reading of these few chapters, or I should say paragraphs, from the town history of Moore's. At this time, I'd like to present some slides and we'll make comments regarding those slides uh, concerning the history of the town of Moores. Thank you. Um, we will be right back uh, to see these slides presented and narrated by Mr. Vogan. Okay, this is a photograph of the person for whom Moores was named. He's a major general in the army and was very prominent as I discussed later in the uh, reading of the uh, paragraphs from the Moores history. General Benjamin F. Moores. This is a descendant that came down during the bicentennial of uh, Moores and in uh, 1976. He's from Maine and he sent me a complete history of the Moores family which is on record in the Moores library. I asked him if that was his wife and he said no that's just a traveling companion. Uh, this is one of the signs in the town of Moores showing that it was formed by the state act from Champlain in March 20, 1904 and the first log hut ten rods east also for its grist and saw mills. This is another sign showing the first bridge built in Moors. Moors Junction was really the center of Moors at one time. It's railway station First town meeting was held at the home of John Shedden. That's down in the village right near the location of the Methodist Church at the present time, 1804. This is a photograph that was taken probably back in the early 30s and shows the actual location of uh, where the first uh, town meeting was held. That's Ralph Lewis's residence on the left-hand side of the photograph. This is the old Fitch block. Now is where the funeral parlor is at Moore's. And um, you can see that was before the car days, horse and buggy days in the village of Moore's. That building, of course, is still standing. This is uh, Jim Fitch and Fred Fillmore. Fitch owned the store and Fred Fillmore was a uh, brother-in-law that also worked in the store. It was quite a nice large uh, department store. This is another view of the Fitch Block, and uh, there's a the location there of a, there's a store, and then where the restaurant is now uh, in Moore's, the Blue Note restaurant. This is uh, down at the block where the insurance agency is, where uh, the, what we call the drugstore at that time, uh, Mr. Stewart owned it at the time that I came to Moore's. Before that, a man by the name of Charlie Humphrey. That block, of course, is still standing. And in that block, farther down next to where the insurance office was, or the drug store, is where we have Samples Variety Store, and beyond that is the residence now, but was where uh, Manette's first furniture store was, in just one end of that. And then the Methodist Church is just on the other side in the post office. This is a the other side of the street, uh, looking uh, east, uh, is uh, some of the old, uh, there's a meat market right there where the men are standing and then there's some other residents along on that east side of the street on Main Street and Moors. You see at that time it's still dirt road. This is some of the old town uh, officers and people there in front of what is now Manette's furniture store. That photograph was taken. I believe that's uh, Abel Knapp that's in the wheelchair. <coughs> This was uh, the uh, mailman delivery at that time, of course, winter time with sleds. Uh, that was uh, Mr. George Fitch, 
who is the father of Catherine Watson and uh, th that uh, family. <coughs> this is Moore's uh, back when there were a lot of trees along the main street and we're looking east there and you can see the uh, railroad uh, station sign uh, down there. The, the D&H Railroad used to go through Moore's from Plattsburgh up through to Hemingford. I'll tell you more about railroads a little later. Um, this was the first foreign agency in Moore's. That was Ralph Lewis that had that. And that's up in uh, near the block that has uh, been recently burned there in the village of Moore's. And uh, standing uh, there is, um, I can't really see from here who the people are that are standing there, but um, I think Ralph is one of them. and. Uh, Percy Brown. That's John Fitch on the pony. Maybe some of you remember John Fitch. He used to run the store in Moores. And Edith Lewis Karen. Edith Karen is on the other pony. And uh, Ralph and some other people are in the background. This is just another later picture. This would be in the 30s of Moores. The road, I believe, is paved there and the restaurant still stands. And Ray's store now is a residence, the one on the left. And the block just above that just burned here this last uh, fall. Now this is the front view of the block where the uh, insurance agency is now. And then the Samples Variety Store in the center. And Manette's first furniture store is, is down in that right-hand side block there on the right-hand side of your photo. Now this is the... Um, railway station in Moores and you can see a, 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 uh, the engine of the train from uh, Plattsburgh heading toward uh, Hemingford, Quebec. The Rutland Railroad ran east and uh, west in the um, E&H north and south. The Rutland Railroad said uh, that we're not as long as the D&H but we're just as wide. This is a uh, picture of the old slipper factory block that was a uh, McDowell Wells store that's where uh, that's been torn down and on the right hand side of the picture is a hotel these are over at what we call Moore's Junction this is uh, Mr. Paul Netto a barber in Moore's in fact uh, when I first came there he cut my hair he is the grandfather of Orville Netto and Beverly Sears who teach for North Eastern Clinton Central School. Uh, Lisa's one of the members of the town board back in the early um, or late 1800s. This is a more up-to-date town board group. Frank Goodrich is on the left and uh, Charles Sample, probably none of you remember him, and Mr. Lamberton uh, is on the right. I've forgotten the name of the um, gentleman with the dark hat on and dark coat. This is another picture of a later town board. Uh, Mr. Sample uh, is on there, and Mr. Lamberton, who is also on the county board. I won't go into detail of all. Mr. Goodrich is there, Mr. Fee, Mr. Press, so forth. This is, uh, this is, in fact, this is uh, quite up to date picture of the town board here just a few years ago. Well, a few years ago now, it was at least uh, uh, 10 years ago, or 12 years ago, when we took the pictures for the bicentennial. It's Davison Pratt on the right, Frank Goodrich Jr. back of him, and Walter Davison, some of you may have heard of and know of, and Bruce Apple, who's the chief custodian of Northeastern Clinton Central, and um, so forth. This is Mr. Charles Chandler, who's a World War veteran, and he's saying eye dog. He was on the Board of Education, Morse, for several years. This is a uh, marker for the Revolutionary Soldier, the only one that we know that is buried in Moors, at least has a marker. And this uh, was uh, Ichabod Bosworth, uh, born in 1748 and uh, died in 1818, I believe. 
and this is just a picture of his uh, gravestone. This is a, a photo up at Moore's Forks. Uh, the hotel at White Building on the left is, of course, long gone, and I don't know just what the other building was, but it shows the Great Chazy River flowing through Moore's Forks. This is the hotel, a uh, front view of the hotel that I just described. Uh, this is a, the Boomhauer store. It was a general store. It says furniture on the top, but they sold uh, uh, most everything in the, what you would call a general store. That's located in Moore's Forks. You notice the length of the dresses then and the difference in dress from what it is today. This is another photograph in Moore's Forks showing more stores, and I believe there's a butter factory just uh, to the right as you uh, are looking to the right of the large store. It's a garage in um, Moore's Forks. That's, of course, long gone, and that road that you see there would lead over now to now what you'd call Altona. In fact, that road was a road that would also go to Ellenburg before the new road was put in and the new bridge that goes through on Route 11. This is Mr. Goodrich and his wife in his general store. And of course, he was clerk for many, many years. He was on the school board for many, many years and was a very outstanding citizen of the Moores Forks area, his wife. The uh, railway station at Moores Forks. This is the old uh, milk station, uh, which now occupied by Francis Menard and Sons uh, for Heating and Plumbing Equipment, was formerly uh, used by Guy Howard. This is just a picture of a Trombley house, which is sort of an inn where people could uh, get meals and uh, stay overnight in traveling. This is another building in Moore's Forks that's long gone. It was located right near the railway station. It was called the Corkins Building. Uh, this building still stands in uh, Moore's Forks. It's where the Paris Garage now is. The road going to the left would lead toward Altona. This is Guy Howard and his son Eldon. I had Eldon in school. I don't know who the other gentleman is. Uh, Guy Howard also ran a, uh, a general store in that he emphasized plumbing and things like that. This is a two-story uh, grade school at Moore's Forks. This is, uh, that building is still standing. Uh, while we were centralized, we had grades uh, one through six in the Moore's Forks area attending that school. And uh, since uh, we have built on uh, additions to the school, they sold, the district sold this school to the um, St. Um, Anne's Parish there at uh, Mork's Forks. This is one of the first schools in the area. This is the North Star School. That school is, uh, or that building is still standing. It was made over into a home that was occupied by Lynn Hogle family. I believe they have moved out of there now and have built a new home, but that building still stands. Now this is the first high school, <coughs> built, brick high school built in Moores. It was built at a cost of $4,000. Back in those days, uh, schoolhouses burned every few years, uh, uh, or any building that caught fire at that time uh, without the fire protection we have now was generally lost. Then that was destroyed by fire in uh, 19, uh, I should be looking at my cards here. <laughs> 1903, and that was replaced by this building, which I think was built for about $17,000. And uh, this was a very nice building, it had a bell tower. And uh, when that building was built, uh, they had training classes for teaching, and people came from the all areas. The only training class in this area of the uh, of uh, the county, and uh, 
they would go there for a couple of years from high school and uh, be certified for teaching. This is a picture of one of the teacher training classes. It looks like they're all women, doesn't it? Yes, October 1908. Yes. I'm not following my card, so I'm not being too exact on this. Uh, this is the building that uh, was built in 1922, I believe. And uh, that's the only building that was at Moore's when I came there. And we ho housed the grades 1 through 12 there. At that time, we didn't have kindergarten. This is one of the high school glass classes that graduated from there. You may know some of the people in there. Uh, Wally Willette is right in the center there, right under the, um, the glass uh, the, in the door there where they have the uh, poster or something. Mm -hmm. And then the principal of the school, Mr. K, is right beside him on the right. And uh, Bob Walker, uh, who is the Walker's funeral home, is uh, uh, well, there's a lady there. I won't try to say who that is, but it's Bob Walker there. Uh, that's right under the near the frame of the building. And then Dr. Hollis Stevenson to his left, and Ralph Curtis to his left. And uh, I, uh, Douglas Channer is away over on the right. I know some of the other people, but I don't want to take time to describe all of them. But I knew that uh, Wally Willett would mean something to you. Okay. This is man here for years. And um, this is a grade school picture. I won't go into details there. The Nellie Kyle was a teacher at that time. Now this is uh, after the new school was built, uh, completed in 1938. Uh, um, the building, the original building, uh, was over in the dark brick, and. Uh, that housed the grades. And over here was mostly uh, junior high and high school, and then we had some elementary kindergarten grades in that building that connects up the, uh, the two buildings. And uh, the old, you see the, the original building there uh, in 1932, the, so forth, it was uh, uh, taken down, I believe, in about 1973. And um, that shows the uh, school as it is today. This is the first customs house in Moores, established in 1823, I believe it says there. And there's a milk station in Moores also just down to the right, and that's right next to the Rutland Railroad. This is a Woodley house. It's on the corner right across from what is Agway now. And he ran a livery, and he had a boarding house there for people to stay overnight. And he ran uh, livery to the depot and back. People would come in on the trains and take them to where they wanted to go. You can see the horses on the left. Uh, this is uh, the old Purdy Hotel on the right. And that's now low-income housing. And the building to the left, of course, has been destroyed, and that's where Route 11 goes through to go to Plattsburgh, when you go right, come up from Champlain and uh, go right straight through Moores, goes into uh, Route 11, goes into Route 22 right there to Plattsburgh. That's where that roadway is. Now, this was the old uh, Purdy Hotel. Uh, at that time, they called it the Brom Lee House. Now this is a, where uh, Manette's Furniture Store is in Moore's at the present time, and that hasn't changed too much since then. Uh, this is the first gas station in Moore's, a gasoline station, and that was uh, right in front of what we known as Ruby Barcombe's place, that is now the sample variety store. There's the Moore's Shirt and Power Company uh, they employed, uh, I think, about 150 people at one time making shirts, and they, and they supplied the power by hydropower from the Great Chazy River and uh, generated their own electricity for that, and later on uh, generated electricity for uh, quite a number of the houses in Moors. And I understand that even later sold some electricity to some people in uh, Hemingford. 
It's all done by the water power. And that old bridge still stands, but it's been blocked off now uh, because of evidently it needs some more repair. Now this is some of the employees, or these are uh, with their truck there. That's quite an odd looking truck that they haul supplies. And this would be in the uh, 20s and probably very early 30s. <coughs> Uh, this is another view showing the slipper factory in the back and the old bridge is, is still there in Moors, right at the breast of the dam. Uh, this is a dam committee. Uh, <laughs> um, we put in a new dam there uh, back uh, in the 50s and um, that supplies uh, water for the uh, fire department and beautifies the, the uh, village and also did provide until lately swimming facilities uh, for the uh, people in the area. This is the churches, the uh, old Methodist church that Moors that uh, burned, and then uh, the new church is the one below that's still standing. I should have had these cards probably. Um, this is the uh, Catholic church in Moors originally, and that, of course, no, this is the original one at Moore's Forks, I believe. Yes, this is the original church at Moore's Forks. And, uh, uh, well, I won't try to get I should have had somebody else run. This is the uh, old Catholic church in Moore's, of course, that was torn down. And uh, this is the old church, Wesleyan Methodist church at uh, Moore's with the parsonage. And, of course, those both burned and a new church was put up. This church building is a Presbyterian church, still standing. It's going to be made over to senior housing, and the um, little building on the left there, the annex, uh, has been torn down, and construction will, reconstruction will start on the church there, remodeling uh, for senior citizen housing this spring. This Methodist church is still standing. <coughs> it's been enlarged, some of the things that was taken. This is a view up at the campground. I particularly put this in because of the car in the front there. That uh, goes way back to the earliest of cars, probably very early 1900s. It looks more like a buggy than a car. It does. No, no running board? Or no anything. running board, no, no nothing. <laughs> not much to it. This is another view at the campground, a little bit taken a little later. Uh, this is the library. Of course, it doesn't look like that now because we have a large tree there in front and the smaller one on the, the left, and there's been some changes there, shutters and so forth, but that picture was taken back at the before the tree grew to that extent. This is a picture of the uh, fire department. This was taken, uh, oh, I would say probably in the 60s, late 60s. This is a group of uh, the um, Ralph J. Davison post, uh, some of the officers and so forth, and uh, Henry White is there. Probably you've heard of Henry White and Charles Chandler and uh, Douglas Dupree and Frank Goodrich and Jim Fitch, uh, who was the son of the fellow that did the mail delivery, died here just a year or so ago, and uh, Henry White. Harrison Elgar also was in there. This is uh, Pete uh, Parrott that we called him Pete, his name was Napoleon, and Cora Fitch. They were the two oldest residents, I'd, except uh, for Mrs. Uh, Plant. And they were at, up at the voting booth, and I took the picture of them at the voting booth there, uh, not too long before each of them died. <coughs> And uh, this is, shows the bicentennial flag and the American flag uh, wars at the time that some of these photos were taken. And that concludes my slides. Thank you for your attention. And I'm, I want to apologize for not <coughs> being able to date some of those pictures a little more accurately than I did, but I couldn't run the projector and uh, look at my notes at the same time. Thank you very much. They were very interesting, Mr. Bogan, and we appreciate you bringing them here today.
I know mm. I recognized a few of the people that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that it's been of interest to a great many of the area. And I'd like to thank you uh, for watching this program today, and I'd also like to thank the news uh, channel and the Hometown Cable for letting us present this program to you. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much again for the invitation. We're very happy mm -hmm. to have you. Thank you.